Hi everyone, I'm here with Todd Carrico, Mark Melendez, and Richard Banco. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Good to be back. So NASA's launching this rocket called Artemis. Have you heard about this? Oh yes, <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> uh, why are we talking about it? Like what's Carter Rock's story? Well, in the days it was Constellation and Constellation consisted of an Orion uh, space capsule that uh, would hold up to six astronauts with the intent of going to the moon and further to Mars. Um, in the meantime, Constellation got canceled in about 2009 and um, the Orion space capsule kept on uh, uh, moving ahead. And in the meantime, NASA has uh, uh, taken the Ares 5 rocket and, and um, replaced it with the Artemis heavy lift rocket, which is uh, what the capsule is going to be on now. Um, NASA came to us, uh, the U.S. Navy, because uh, it had been a while since they've done uh, the Apollo program. And, and basically, the Orion capsule is a scaled up version of the Apollo, and they wanted to see how uh, what the hand sea keeping handling characteristics of the new um, Orion capsule would be uh, once once it reached uh, splashdown and and uh, be able to recover it from the from the ocean after splashdown. Mm -hmm. So uh, the Navy came to us wanted to know if we'd be interested in in participating in that. <laughs> and, uh, of course, we said sure, uh, <laughs> engineers that we are. Of course, we want to work with NASA on the space capsule. Our question back to them was, well, why did you forget, right? You know, because clearly you had it down pat with Apollo landing in the ocean. Oh, yeah. And it was just one of these perfect storms where you had enough time that a whole generation had gone through the shuttle and that corporate knowledge slowly uh, moved away from NASA. So they had to relearn what they already knew or should have known. And that's where we came into play. NASA would, would make what they would call boilerplates and these were mock-up test vehicles typically high resolution vehicles that uh, that they would use to uh, do uh, landing tests and uh, splashdown tests things like that and Any, anything that they had to to check out before an actual uh, space launch and so uh, the navy we were uh, given a contract and uh, to, to make a high resolution boilerplate of the Orion space capsule as we knew it at the time. And uh, uh, NASA came to us and, you know, they were hoping that uh, <clears throat> maybe we would just do the testing, but we said, well, we can do everything. We can, we can build it for you. We can design it for you. We can uh, do other auxiliary testing that you need to do. For sure. You know, it's certainly one of these things that starts small and just snowballs, mm -hmm. right? And then you look back and all of a sudden there's this uh, mountain of work you've done. And not, not only was it successful, it was done basically on budget and on schedule, which was very critical because they were running their program. So we had to give answers that fed directly into the design team, right? right? Very critical answers about how this is going to work and what other changes you need to make basically in real time to keep their schedule. We had to actually freeze the design too. They had to give us, was it 606D was the design that they froze at the time, the Lockheed's, mm -hmm. Lockheed's design. And we had to simplify it and, and make our, this, wrap our boilerplate around that design and not worry about other changes that were going to come down the pipe. Yeah, but, the, but the, one of the interesting things in the design brief was uh, this is how it looks today, 606D but please build in enough margin and ability that it can be changed and updated as the real design goes along because we want something for the long run that flexible. Can, that's flexible. And that's very hard to do sometimes uh, when you don't know what the future looks like to keep enough margin in there. But from what I've heard talking to the guys down in Houston, uh, it's done every bit that and they're very happy with it now 10 yeah. years, more than 10 years later. We had a very simplified hatch design that they eventually replaced, I think multiple times with ultra complex mechanisms with dogs and a, a complex latching system so they could really practice getting in and out and retrieving the astronauts. But uh, 
and the hatch location was spot on. That didn't really change, but the stuff on top and the board area did, did change after the fact. We've seen pictures of it evolving over time, and it's it's just it's really cool to see as it's been going along the changes that they made. They replace mm -hmm. this, we'll do that. Right, but the foundation is still perfectly yep. good. Basically, NASA wanted a, uh, the an article that the uh, para jumpers could uh, could actually use and test and and walk around and put on the flotation gear that oh everything uh, that needed to be put on that mm -hmm. they used to do in the Apollo program and of course no para jumper today <laughs> was ever <laughs> uh, involved in doing any of that so this was all news to them yeah. so this gave them a tremendous test vehicle that they could uh, could train on. And thank goodness yeah. they did. They alert um, uh, John um, Kennedy Space Center went through several iterations of the flotation collar that yep. uh, yeah. how it attaches to the new um, space uh, space capsule Orion capsule versus uh, Apollo. So yep. I mean, yeah. So it's been a great great test vehicle um, that, that's been utilized. Um, by NASA for mm -hmm. the past 13 years and, yeah, and still going strong, getting cool. experience to um, yeah. bringing this thing home cool. <laughs> into the well deck of a ship. Um, that's certainly the, the big piece, right? But there was, there was also other supporting parallel tracks that we did, right? There was the quarter scale West article that we tested, mm -hmm. right? There was the genome that came afterwards. There was even a 10th scale that we did. So it wasn't just necessarily the big boilerplate. There were multiple paths happening simultaneously, all converging, hopefully, with new knowledge and insight. And one, one of the offshoots of the thing, of course, um, NASA needs to take into any contingency that might happen during the uh, launch and recovery of a space capsule. During, the, during launch, abort um, can be Obtained any uh, can be uh, commanded any time between launch at Cape Canaveral until uh, approximately seven to ten minutes later when the um, rocket reaches off the coast of Scotland. So, mm -hmm. so there's a, a huge expanse of the Atlantic Ocean mm -hmm. that uh, that the capsule could fall into right. uh, during an abort, right. and NASA wanted to be able to ensure that their astronauts are going to survive in the interior of the <laughs> of the spacecraft during up to sea state six, which is a pretty nasty <laughs> environment. That's right. And uh, if they can't get to them uh, very quickly, that uh, perhaps a ship of opportunity that, uh, close by can, can get to the uh, capsule and either put a tagline on it and tow it to more sheltered waters mm -hmm. or uh, have the gear on board to uh, put the flotation gear on and help get the astronauts out. So, right. so one of the things we also did in the quarter scale was to um, do towing tests to see how well this thing would tow. Well, space capsules don't tow very well <laughs> in the ocean. So, no. but we did uh, uh, come up with a rig that uh, we were able to um, be able to. Mm -hmm any ship of opportunity to tow this back to land or, or a port of opportunity uh, up to 10 knots, which is, a, is another outgrowth of what we did, a part of the testing. Yeah, I remember one of the first meetings we were in with the NASA community. Maybe it was out at Denver at Lockheed's place. I don't, I don't quite know, but I got in there and I started talking about this thing as a floating vessel, right? And they're like, no, it's a spaceship. I'm like, yeah, but now it's in the water. So I'm looking at it through our perspective as a naval architect here at right. Carter Rock. Mm -hmm. I'm going to assign it some characteristics or I'm going to talk about it in terms of nautical terms, right? So I'm going to give it a bow. I'm going to give it a port side, a starboard side, right? And, and that's how we're going to uh, quantify the performance in those kind of terms. And so what that really did um, was open up a line of communication where both parties had to start thinking about how we were going to meet and communicate about this thing because they're looking at it from the aerospace side and we're looking at it from the naval side. Correct. And to yep. really be able to convey the knowledge and the insight, we had to find some common ground, even on terminology. 
Sea states. They were using the O4 scale. Yeah. Right. And we were used to using the different, I can't even remember the term. Oh my gosh. <laughs> okay. well. the, the NATO state night charts. Yeah. 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 And so it was like their sea states didn't correlate necessarily. We had to yeah. line them up and say, okay, well, we're yeah. talking about this, right. this yeah. wave height. Let me ask you with NASA's concern for no surprises, safety and human factors. What were our considerations? What were we controlling for? So going back to the comment about now it's a boat, yeah. right? Well, it's basically a buoy, like what Rich was saying. It's, it's a body of revolution. It's not how you really design a ship. Right. So we had a pretty good idea initially that this thing was going to be a horrible ride once it was in the waves. I right. envisioned a fishing bob. Right. <laughs> and certainly all of the experiments, the numerical simulations, all that proved us correct. So. You take that uncomfortable ride and you marry it with the fact that the astronauts are in a deconditioned state, having just come back from the moon or long outer space durations, um, their safety is paramount, right? They're not gonna be able to get themselves out. They can't egress upon themselves. That's right. the role of the para-jumpers. So what they really needed to know was just how hard it was going to be to extract these people, and not just the people, but the spacesuits and all the gear. Mm -hmm. It's basically 200, maybe 250 pounds of dead weight. Mm -hmm. How do I get that out of that thing when it's pitching and rolling uncontrollably? And we, we saw that in the, in the full-scale testing off yep. of Cape Canaveral, and, uh, and we, we were able to test in probably what, a good sea state four, four. Maybe a high four. A high four. Right. Uh, we had, we had 10 foot waves at that time. Yeah. And I mean, yeah. you would lose sight of the capsule <laughs> over the, uh, in the, in the troughs, through right. the uh, crest and trough of the wave. I mean, it, yeah. I mean, it was, yeah. and, and that is a nasty, nasty environment to be in. I was in a small boat uh, around it. And let me tell you, <laughs> it's not tri something it to trifle is. with. One of the questions they had in terms of egress was, there's two ways out of that capsule. Yeah. You can go out the side hatch, which is what everybody thinks about, but you can also go out through the top. There's a top tunnel, and they were wondering which one was going to be best. They had this idea that maybe they could lower in a winch and pull the people right. up. Remember mm -hmm. that? Yeah. And, and what our results started to show was you don't want to be on the top of this thing. That's because that's where the accelerations and the motions are most amplified. Right. You need to take them out through the side. Right. That's and, correct. And then that's really where the flotation color came in. Yeah. The one guy from Kennedy, especially, he brought his flotation stuff with him when we went to the explosives pond so he could do a, a fit test. And actually, when we were swinging in building 19, he fit up his, his flotation balls and the skirt. Mm -hmm. he, could, he basically fitted up what he could fit. And then later on, he brought it back again and they actually tested it in the explosives pond. And it fit pretty well from what we saw. And the parajumpers were happy to start climbing on it right off the bat and and they had some fun they even jumped off the top of it i mean they were they were having fun it it, it worked for just what they wanted right. and and that was only the first iteration i think from the mm -hmm. kennedy guys the design yeah. team there can you tell us a little bit more about the testing from start to finish what was happening here at carter rock uh where we were and then how it progressed yeah well think about it from small to large okay um and we said before, we had a quarter scale and a full scale boilerplate. But before all that, uh, we built a one tenth perfect mock up um, SLA. SLA, right? Yeah. And which was one of the very first times Cardrock had done something like that because we used transparent SLA. Yeah. The idea being that um, when the thing splashes down, there's a very good chance, or we were led to believe there's a very good chance that the heat shield will be compromised, which means it will take water on. And so um, the way the, the capsule is designed, there's a pressure vessel in, at the inside, and that's where the, the astronauts remain. But there's an outer cavity around that, um, which is not pressurized, and that had a good chance of being flooded or partially flooded due to the impact of the splashdown. So um, the point was that we didn't know how much flooding potential there was. And so we said, well, we can do this two ways. We can go develop a really high-end simulation, or we can go to first principles. We can build a small mock-up, yeah. and we can simply pour water into that aft bay area 
put it in one of our tanks and see where it equalizes, and boom, you've got your flooding potential. Cool. So that was the small tenth scale, which was pretty neat, and then yeah. it became a great display model right. after yes. that, right? <laughs> yes. um, but from that, then we went to West, right? We went to West, which was a quarter scale model that uh, um, Kennedy Space Center uh, had built for us, yeah. or for themselves, and then uh, they adapted it for us, and we used that for um, towing tests um, here at the basin to see um, mm -mm, how, how we can tow this uh, by a ship of opportunity. Uh, we came up with a, a satisfactory towing arrangement. And then we also used that to go to Aberdeen's um, test pond there, which um, mm -hmm. we could simulate up to C state six in That's quarter right. scale uh, with their uh, large wave makers there. Yeah. And we did that and uh, we got the um, indices for um, you got well, wealth in the, uh, <coughs> sickness sure. indices, if you will, yes. <laughs> for the astronauts, or yeah, and uh, the puke factor, right? Yeah, <laughs> puke factor is exactly right. Um, but but before we go there, though, tell them a little bit about uh, what we found though on the tow test, right? When we were on carriage, was it two? On carriage, on carriage two, two, all yeah. the crazy stuff that happened hydrodynamically. Oh my gosh, you. Um, when we we first thought about towing this thing. Uh, uh, trying to tow it with the um, skirt on, as you can see in that piece. Well, it just wants to nosedive in and, and it wants to just uh, be pulled right underwater. I mean, mm -hmm. we just found that uh, in, in, with the collar on and with the collar off. And until you um, hold the stern down with the, what we came up with is a little depressor off the stern to hold the, uh, the bow of the, um, of the capsule up and to be able to basically plane its way through the <laughs> through the water right. and uh, that was the satisfactory towing up there right. and, and that really opened up nasa's eyes to well maybe we can keep the astronauts in there because we can tow them safely in a safe orientation for extended periods of time and it, it was very stable um uh planning on the surface like that yeah it's like a surfboard right yeah. I, remember, <laughs> yeah, I remember going to the test and seeing it and as a matter of fact um we we during the full scale launching uh, off Cape Canaveral, we tried to launch it off of using a boom crane off of the ship, and boy, oh boy, that turned out to be a disaster. And uh, we ended up towing the capsule out every day to the operations uh, area uh, right. with the same type of arrangement that we had done, and it, right. it worked perfectly. I mean, it was it was great. It was. Yeah. Uh, proved to be non-hazardous to, to yeah. people working on the fan tail of a ship like that. It, was, the, it the, was easy to do. One of the neat things about Aberdeen, so after the tow test, then we immediately went up the road to the Army base. Um, they have that outdoor littoral environment where they basically simulate landings, amphibious landings, right? Uh, and like Rich said, they have very, very large wave makers. And because of the scale, the quarter scale, uh, it was only, this, you know, it was even not even the size of this table, but still it was big enough that the wave makers in the mask were not going to give us the right sea state. So we had to go outside, yeah. think outside the box. Mm -hmm. And uh, John Hoyt just happened to be developing a relationship with those guys. And it was one of the very first things that we took up there to be tested. Right. And um, they had the wave makers, but they didn't have a wave basin. So right. all the test equipment, all the instrumentation, everything we take for granted in the mask isn't there. <laughs> so we had to surge all that equipment for weeks on end up there and basically set up uh, an ad hoc test facility just to do the sea keeping portion of it. Mm -hmm. John, John, I think, helped them to select and even pick their design that they bought mm -hmm. to install for that facility because right. they were an army. They, they would proof out the previous, uh, it was the AAAV, was what they were working on right. sometime before then, which turned into the EFV. And so they would go to Aberdeen and prove the tank aspect of this amphibious vehicle, and then they'd go out to San Diego or Camp Pendleton and proof out the naval side of it. And John was the expert that worked with them, and he also worked with Aberdeen. And when they needed to pick a wave maker, he helped them select it, and right. so he was he was the yep. yeah, he was the authority for them. What was his name again? John Hoyt. Hoyt. Oh, yeah. So, at the conclusion of the quarter scale campaign, we really had our first look at the overall performance, expected performance of Orion, 
And I remember going down to Johnson and briefing everybody about that. And, mm -hmm. and here comes the second round. Remember, I talked before about trying to meet them on, with some common language, right? So I go down there and I remember talking about the, um, the human factors elements, right? right? Like, so we, we calculated uh, not just the, the motion sickness indices, the pukeness, but we also calculated MIIs, which are um, basically when you fall over because of a, a lateral acceleration, right? Um, as well as fatigue calculations too. None of it looked good, <laughs> right? <laughs> and um, I'm about an hour into my brief and then uh, one of the SES is, uh, is like, okay, well, what does all, all that mean? You know, stop giving me numbers, just tell me what it means. And I'm like, well, sir, it means that basically in C-State 4 and above, your astronauts are gonna puke their guts out, most likely, right? Yep. So yep. if you're gonna expose them to that seaway, you better get to them fast and get them either the hell out of Dodge right. or out of that capsule because it will end up being a bad day for them. Right. And these are people, these astronauts are already going through the training that puts them through that type of yeah. intensive you know, environmental condition. Yeah. yeah. And so they're still going to experience that when they hit the earth and get into the water. Yeah. So you know, that, that last step in the mission is non-trivial for sure. Yeah. Right. And yeah. that, <laughs> This thing, it's a, a basically a cork bobbing around right. in the in the ocean, and the yeah. stiffness of the two axes are pretty much the same. So you're going to get yeah. uh, you're going to get compound motions that are going to yeah. be extremely high uh, right. accelerations. That yeah, and the heat right. too. The they did not train at NASA for this. Right. <laughs> and their orientation too. They're actually laying back with their legs up. <laughs> and they're That's right. there and they're they're pointing up <laughs> and going through the motion. So yeah, it's it, it's just yeah. not a pleasant <laughs> it's not. Um, the other thing I think we should mention real quick though, the the quarter scale article before we got our hands on it was also used to prototype the upriding bags. Yes. Right? Yes. That's right. They had the little they had miniature ones that they tinkered with. And we have pictures of that that we saw. What are those? The writing bags are actually the, the spherical bags that are on the top. They're the three that you can balls. notice on that picture. Thank you. Those balls. All right, thank so, you. So um, they, they would end up, um, Rich had mentioned once before, the, there were two conditions that they would consider the capsule to be in stable one, which is upright, and stable two, which is completely upside down. Right. And they did not want to be upside down. Right. <laughs> and, and given its shape, it's more stable upside down than it is right side up <laughs> in the water. Right. right. So you flip over, and that happens at splashdown. You've got to figure out a way to get it back upright. Right. Otherwise, your astronauts are just hanging in their harnesses. Yeah, facing down. Facing down, and, and you're not, so. Plus, right. you can't get them out the door and you can't get them out the top. Oh, so right. that's, it's job number one. Yeah. That's, you can't rescue them. Yep. So in that context, if it did have to eject prior to a planned reentry, where we could coordinate rescue right. and recovery, they could be in the ocean for a little bit longer than originally planned in that environment. So that's that's why you see those balls on the top of the... <laughs> okay, got it. Yep. Yep. They're there for a specific purpose. Right. Okay. It's a big ocean, right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> it might take a while for the cavalry to show up. Right. I, I thought I remember hearing them say four hours was like right. one of the quickest... Right, okay. and that's where, those, that's where those fatigue numbers started to come in, right? Because we would do four, eight, 16, 24, two days, three days, yeah. and... You know, if they were just unlucky enough to be in a moderate seaway that was there for the day, right. uh, if it took them 12 hours to get to them, they were going to be in a very, very weak state. Very, well, terrible. <laughs> yeah. so. All right. So what were some of the major challenges and how did you overcome them? How did we overcome them? Oh, boy. Yeah. First off, I mean, I remember when when they first approached us, I remember getting a call from, from Todd. He was in with our division head. With Terry and they were talking about if we had a full scale rep of Orion, could we test it in the mass? <laughs> and that's right. They did. First, that. That's the, right. The first thing, first thing I said was, "Well, oh, why don't you just do a quarter scale or something like that? Because it's just going to be it's too big." And then we found out later on that the floor loading in the mass couldn't even support the weight if we tried to transport it in. Right. And to get it in. Also, they talked about potentially using a crane. We had to tear a part of the roof off just to get it in to the basin. And then 
also our waves, we, we couldn't make big enough waves to get to the sea states we want to look at, yeah. especially what they yeah. want to look at in the heavy sea states. Right. And then you know, we talked a little bit before about the design brief, right? They wanted something that was going to be flexible, adaptable for the future, modular, right? Yep. Um, but at the same time, robust. And, and Rich had, came up with a really good design uh, for the boilerplate that satisfied those sometimes opposing constraints. Um, I would say the biggest thing though was just schedule, oh, right? For sure. The schedule, we were always, I mean, it was highly compressed, what, 12, 18 months of nonstop working. Not just the three of us, we were just the tip of the iceberg, but the entire Carter Rock team right. was all, it was all hands oh, yeah. on deck. Right. Yeah, building nine was water jet cutting stuff and bending metal contractor riggings down in Hampton Roads was taking pieces as we got them to them and welding them together. And, and well, so. I remember one of our first challenges we had was convincing Carter Rock management to do it. To do it. Yeah. <laughs> this this was not typically in the realm of, <laughs> of uh, that's right uh, Navy Navy, uh, yeah, right. Navy actions to to do so. Right. Yeah. Um, Fortunately, we had uh, Commander Andrew, uh, Andy Kewitt um, was the liaison officer for the Navy uh, uh, between NASA and the Navy. And um, he had a pretty convincing talk with uh, Captain Thomas at the time. That's right. And uh, yeah, uh, once, once he got out of that talk, Captain Thomas was on it. <laughs> yep. I mean, full, it, full bore. It yep. was a great PR opportunity for us, yep. right? So, absolutely. So, once management was behind us, then it was really the pressure was doubled up. Now, right. don't screw it up, right? right. <laughs> Before that, we were kind of flying under the radar. Yeah. Um, I remember driving with Rich back to Rich's <laughs> office, and Rich said, Well, we won the contract, but now comes the hard part <laughs> <the> delivery. <laughs> We've got to do this in a year. Uh, and, yeah. One of the interesting things uh, to meet the challenges was on the design side, uh, I remember spending many, many sessions with you yeah, at the computer, at, at the computer um, in the old Code 55, the seakeeping group. At that time, we were starting to really get more advanced on how we would design our models. Um, and we were using SolidWorks, right, for the first time? Yeah. Yep. And if you look closely in some of these shots, you can see just how much crap there is in that, <laughs> that outer bay section, that void I talked about before. Right. Um, so Thanks. when you think about what the boilerplate has to do, it has to simulate um, <clears throat> not just the physical size of the real thing, it also has to mimic its center of gravity, it has to weigh the same, and its gyradius radius all have to be the same. Otherwise, how it moves will be different. Right. So as a designer, Right, we had this challenge of mimicking that, but then also putting in all the equipment, test equipment we needed to put into that, and and coming to the same uh, target numbers. Mm -hmm. And we went around and around and around, but by shifting to SolidWorks and doing it with 3D modeling, we could go through several iterations in an hour, which is way faster than we had ever done it here at Carter Rock. Uh, and arrive at a solution so that he could go start building it right. uh, the next day. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, we had to, and another thing, we had to figure out how to swing the model, which is normally fig was getting the, the yeah. inertial characteristics yeah. to match what it would really be. Right. And that meant adding weight inside of it uh, to get it to what we needed. We had a platform inside of it and a linear slide that we could remote control to have it yeah. move so that as it was in the water, it could list yeah. to one side as if it was flooded to the one side right. and, yeah. and leaning so we could look at those characteristics and how it bobbed around. But because right. it was so big, the, <laughs> the equipment that we normally would use to swing the model, as we call it, we would, we would actually rock the model back and forth and get its yeah. characteristics yeah. from yeah. that. We didn't have that equipment. We had to figure out right. our method. Right. I mean, the, the, the scale here was, was beyond what we were used to working with. <laughs> yeah. Right. So every process yeah. that we would normally go through had to be reevaluated and most of the time altered yeah. significantly yeah. to accomplish the same goal. Um, the, but I forgot about the slide, though. That slide by itself was a pretty nice little piece of engineering. So there was, what, 1,000 pounds, 2,000 pounds? 
of lead yep. on that slide that ran the entire inner space. Yep. And um, just the reason for that though, was also because um, the capsule had a CG offset. Remember that? Correct, yes. Because so. when it comes in, they use it to actually steer it yep. in re-entry. So most people think it's just right in the middle. It's not, it's off to one side. So we put the uh, orientation of that slide on that axis right. to help us dial in uh, and fine tune mm -hmm. the center of gravity. Yeah, because yeah. their weight, actually, yeah, all the astronaut yeah. weight right. were offset so yeah. they could see out the windows. Yeah, and I remember one day Rich and I were testing and it was one of these conditions where we intentionally fully flooded. So it was in its heaviest, most obnoxious state. Right. And it was really leaning really back. Listed and on I'm it. like, oh I know it's gosh. not gonna sink, right. but it doesn't look good, <laughs> right? And we went to recover it. And I, I told the PJs, hold on a second. Let's take some water out. No, we didn't take water out. Oh. I hit your button and I oh. moved the slide table to the other <laughs> side and it magically <laughs> corrected the list and yep. they were able to deal with it. So. It paid off in many different ways. Yeah. Oh. And then what was it? Uh, in our manuals, there was a, a guy by the name of Ralph Stahl who had put in our manuals a method called the bifila method. And that would be hanging it by cables and swinging it equidistant from the CG or whatever model you're testing. And that would help get us those characteristics that we weren't able to get on our, what we call the A-frame over in building 18. Yep. It was way bigger than it was bigger yeah. than our A-frame. So yeah. that the biggest model up to that point was a 20-foot EDG model that was around 4,000 pounds. So yeah. This was hopping out of 20-ish. Right. right. It's big, right? right? And we went through a lot of safety reviews with the crane and lift guys. Yep. Remember all that? Oh my God. Everything had to be certified. Yep. And the day came, was it the, the high bay? Is that where the we did it? High bay and building 19. Building 19. And you talk oh. about challenges. Right. We made it in the door. <laughs> with a couple inches to spare. Wow. I mean, it was a tight, tight fit. But once we were in, it was showtime, and uh, I was holding my breath, but it worked flawlessly. You got well, that stinger in and lifted I mean, it up. When we first tried it, we were, you know, we were, we were only moving this thing, not even a degree uh, for, for the swinging of it. And then we were, we were looking and we were noticing that the, it was wagging the, the crane up above too. <laughs> right. and, yeah. and so we had to um, shore up uh, the crane support um, cables yeah. up there in order to give us a true um, by faller um, yeah. Uh, yeah. swing. So yeah. Uh, so yeah. But, but the neat trick though, was when we switched the axis oh, with, with the yes. stinger. Explain yes. that one, because that, <laughs> that, that was pretty cool. We had to figure out a way because the center of gravity of this cone-shaped object was so low, when you turned it on its side, that was now the same, we wanted the CG to be in the middle of this object. And in order to do that, we had another piece of lead cast that was 2,800 pounds and we had to stick it out three <laughs> feet. Five feet or so. Oh, it's just it a was. massive counterweight. Yeah, we had to have a massive. counterweight to move the CG out and just because of that, we, we were concerned about bending something in the upper hatch and the upper tube. And also mm -hmm. we had to have an equivalent point on the bottom of the vessel that we could mm -hmm. bolt into and actually hold it sideways. Right. And we, we yeah. just named it the rotisserie method. Yes, yeah. <laughs> yeah. like, But that was an interesting design detail in the heat shield that we came up with, that's was right. to take that unique load that the real thing never would see. <laughs> that's right. yeah. And we couldn't go. We couldn't go all the way through. Like normally, we want to put it on a spit or something like that. But we we couldn't go through because it was supposed to be an airtight the pressure vessel. Vessel. Right. Yeah. So we had to figure out a way structurally to do it right. on both sides without yep. messing up the, the cap. To me, one of the, one of the biggest challenges, well, certainly that I had was um, in the fabrication of this. Uh, you know, we've got the design that's ongoing. We we had testing that was ongoing at the same time all kinds of concurrent engineering going on between structures and you know uh, materials yes. yep. um, we had to order order materials and they had to come with certifications on it because you know nasa wanted certifications for yep. the welding and yeah um, getting these materials in our shop was was um uh, we had just got our um, water jet cutter 
So oh. this was an ideal yeah, yeah. <laughs> project yeah. to use that um, that water jet cutter. I yeah. mean, we we were cutting out tremendous pieces of stainless steel over there, yeah, yeah, yeah. and then we'd bring them down to a, a welding contractor that could certify the welding and and <laughs> X-ray and all that uh, yeah. stuff. So there was a lot of coordination between materials sure was. and uh, getting them done in time, getting the right parts done right. at the right time yeah. so that they were yeah. in the build cycle at the proper times. That, that was it, right? If you laid out the master schedule, right? And you and you looked at how where a critical path was, yep. right? No. There was not a lot of slip no. on that path. Mm. No matter if we're talking the steel longerons, if we're talking in the slide table, if we're talking even just all that foam equipment that we put in the aft bay, right. the heat shield, remember the heat shield? The heat, the heat shield was another whole endeavor. A 16 foot diameter dish, can you imagine? Yeah, <laughs> spun a little. Making that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I can... So, but it, you know, I, I think the key to the success was um, our communication at the management level, you know, the real team management level was exceptional. And we had trust in one another to divide and conquer knowing we were on the same page. That's right. And that the configuration would remain whole. Right. Uh, the three out. of us together, we, we just- I was camping out. We the worked, <laughs> yeah. I mean, we worked night and day on this and, and we helped each other every step of the way along the way. Yeah. Let me tell you. Any, any particular, and, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, and like I said, we probably had um, 30 people here on station, uh, you know, between the shops, the welding shop, the um, yeah. sheet metal shop, uh, machine shop, uh, the trucking even guys. The, the wood shop. Yeah, the shop. Uh, yeah the shop. I mean, it was, it was just tremendous. Yeah, even the uh, explosion pond, right? Yeah. When we put it in the explosion pond for the first yep. time, the floated, like it, I can't think of another project that really touched every aspect of Carter Rock. It was the complete shop got made some level of contribution. Awesome. Yep. So that picture is back there. You hold one of them? It's one, one of them. them. Yeah. 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 All, the, all the people in the That's about half the team, right? When you really think wow. about it. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. That was the day um, when we basically commissioned the boilerplate port. Mm. That was the day uh, we took it to the explosion pond because we needed to see if it would float. <laughs> of course, it's going to float. Yeah. But NASA wanted it proven in, and it was a good uh, opportunity. Again, we can't take it to the mask. Right. We don't want to go off site. Let's use the explosion pond. Right. And uh, once we're comfortable with it and check it out, we'll let uh, NASA and the PJs come play with it a little bit in a controlled environment right. before it got on the road. And, uh, and, a, and lot of the, a lot of the big people downtown, they wanted to come see they it. They wanted to come see it because it was local. Yeah. And there were a lot of visitors there. Yeah. There were Especially when you, when you truck that out right. and get a crane, all of a sudden yeah. everybody starts looking. Usually when you do something in the explosion pond, you can't be around it, right? <laughs> in this case, everybody wanted to be in the explosion <laughs> right. pond, right? right? And check out the, uh, the new cool thing. That's awesome. Yeah. When the Artemis mission is returned to Earth, as this thing's coming back to Earth, what are we looking at? What are we watching for? How do we know we did our job? Hmm. We're looking at if they replicate the process that we started to see for the first time in the test that Rich and Todd were on off of Cape Kennedy. I mean, to see if they can actually approach it, put on the skirt, do, the, do what they said, uh, do what they practiced and retrieve it in a proper method with uh, with the pair jumpers and also bring it into the mm -hmm. well deck. Yeah. You know, when, you, when you're at Carter Rock and you have the opportunity to go on trials, mm -hmm. and it doesn't matter if it's uh, a destroyer, if it's a sub, whatever, um, usually you're going out there to verify your prediction. And the best case scenario is a very boring, very expected behavior. That's what you want to see, right? You don't want surprises. <laughs> don't so want success for us would basically be something like, yep, yeah, went just as planned, no, uh, no problems at all. Right. Uh, to see the thing being towed in to the well deck of the ship and, yeah. and uh, anchored safely in its uh, nest there in the well deck, that's, uh, 
we've done our job. In other words, we've we've built a um, test unit that the Navy has has used uh, to verify all that uh, that operational readiness for uh, recovery of the um, of the Orion space capsule mm -hmm. once it comes back. So, does this renew that knowledge? Post Apollo, does it sort of re-verify or re-establish the information NASA needs about this? Uh, certainly, I think though we take it way beyond what uh, Apollo knew, right? I mean, right. if you just think about the naval architecture uh, knowledge that's that's happened since the '60s, right. uh, it's been a tremendous explosion of scientific principles and application, and. Um, and so, especially like in the human factor side, right? Yeah. Uh, we're getting to apply that and, and make estimates that they didn't have back in the day. One of the things that early on in the program that we were able to do is we had a special invite by NASA to, to go up to the Udvar Space, uh, Hazy Space Museum and basically behind the ropes play day yeah. with the Apollo, <laughs> the Apollo um, boilerplate that they have up there on display. Mm -hmm. And uh, it would be a tremendous honor uh, to see the Orion space capsule boilerplate that we built to be um, set aside right alongside the Apollo capsule up at Udvar Hazy. I, I would love to see that one day. Uh -huh. And you can see the difference in magnitude, right. the size of the two, of the two vehicles. I mean, yeah. it's, it's huge. All right. Yeah, that was one of the first things I did on the computer was we had a sketch that involved <laughs> yeah. Of, yeah. of the Apollo and it was, oh my gosh, it's so much bigger. <laughs> it's so much. It's it is. Just, and it is really big. It, it's yeah. much bigger um, in any way you um, measure it, yeah. for sure. So we safely land, we recover. What would you as engineers like to ask NASA or the astronauts? Where's my e-ticket? <laughs> oh, oh boy. How did, how, did the, how did the landing go? I mean, how did that retrieval go? That's the biggest thing. Like yeah. Todd said, I mean, if it's, if it's boring, it's routine, and they just kind of get them in line, pull them in, close well deck, everything's secure, right. and they're done, that's, I mean, you know, does it feel good? Or you you know, were you sick? How sick were you? What was mm -hmm. what was the deal? Yeah. The emotions. Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. yeah. Show me the data. Show me the data. I think yeah. uh, <laughs> exactly. Um, I think there's a great opportunity here for uh, correlation and calibration um, against some of these uh, human factor indices we spoke of before, right? right. Because you're going to get actual real world data. You know, every mission is another potential source of data. <clears throat> about how did they do, right? Did they puke? Did, were they able to get out? Did they really need assistance? All of that, uh, if we think about it, could be a wealth of information forthcoming that could go back and help drive the science and maybe make some adjustments on those uh, measures that we do here at Carter, or are done at Carter Rock. Well, one of the things that uh, brings to my mind is that uh, uh, with the uh, landing of the um, Orion capsule coming back from this mission, that kind of puts an end to the um, to the port project that we worked on, but it's also the beginning of the genome pro project that we mm -hmm. also did for NASA, where right. we built a mock-up that they use at the um, uh, Neutral Buoyancy uh, Laboratory in Houston that the astronauts actually train on for doing uh, extra vehicular activities, EVAs, where they go outside of the capsule and, uh, and right. control modules and perform work or experiments outside. And uh, so we also built that uh, uh, capsule right uh, right. mock-up for them called uh, Genome. Right. And that is currently in use at the NBL. Yeah. And that's what the astronauts will be training on yeah. as they maneuver around the space capsule. They, they try out various handholds that would work best for traversing around the exterior of the capsule. Right. So that will start taking off and be more and more used as the uh, Absolutely. port gets retired. Yep. So, yep. so it was twofold and it's, uh, it's gonna be used. I mean, it's, that's, that's the beauty of it. It's all being used, you know, 
to this day, yeah. <laughs> 12 years after being built. We have a lot of current and future engineers here at Carter Rock. What are some things you could tell them about this type of project? Um, I think this is a great project that shows the value of getting away from your desk. Get down there on the shop floor, work with what you designed, understand it, see it from cradle to grave, right? And and take all those lessons along the way. Yeah, work with machinists, work with the people that are building it, work with the vendors that are welding it, give feedback, talk to them, you learn you learn things well, I shouldn't have done it that way because now the guy can't reach his hand and do this. Oh okay, yeah. we can do that. Well we can make it easier. We can talk to the machinists or somebody that that actually makes it and they give you that insight. Yeah, one of the, one of the things I encourage I encourage all the young engineers that are here at the station to make sure you get out on a sea trial. To see what this stuff is really like out in the yeah. out in the ocean. Uh, Absolutely. Nothing like being out in a 15 foot boat in 11 foot seas. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it just uh, it's it's such an experience that you you just uh, you can't describe it. I mean, it's you, you're not going to see it sitting at, like you said sitting at a desk. Yep. So I encourage the. Uh, full-scale trials to be um, experienced by everybody. I mean, it's just, it's wonderful. That's right. And you take that knowledge, you take that experience back to your desk, right. and you have a better appreciation for what it is you're trying to recreate or design for, because mm -hmm. you've experienced it firsthand what nature really throws at you. Mm -hmm. not just a number. It's not just a number, exactly. It, it has meaning behind the number. Don't get too comfortable. Mm. Seek out challenges, seek out things that are different, that will stretch you as an engineer or whatever your role is at Carter Rock, and then rise to the occasion and you'll be better for it. Mm. We did, and it's paid off in spades. Yeah. That's correct. And there's been a lot of other projects that I've been on in my years here at Carter Rock that have been just eye openers and one of a kind type of thing. and. The opportunities, uh, the, the diversity of work that comes in here and what you can contribute and what you will learn uh, uh, as life experiences are just tremendous here. Take it all in. Because you never know where it's going to go.